Hello, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me to talk. I'm going to talk about designing around the customer, designing the experience of a customer. I want to introduce some of the basic concepts around design, um, some of the language that we use around design, and tell just a couple of stories. And I look forward to joining this uh, conference for, the, for the, uh, the next two days and learning from you. <clears throat> so today, design is really, really important. And many companies are embracing the power of design. And sometimes we struggle to use design effectively. So I, I want to introduce this very simple concept, <clears throat> which is that to see, you need to not see. And this is very difficult for companies as a whole, and it's very difficult for professionals within a company. But it's what we have to do as designers. I'm going to illustrate this with a couple of quotes. <clears throat> I think it was uh, Sinclair who said, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. And I, I would like to add the corollary to that famous quote from Upton Sinclair, which it is difficult to not understand something when your salary depends on understanding it. Let me give you a simple example from some work that I did a few years ago. This is some work with the Benazir Income Support Program in Pakistan, which was trying to distribute about the equivalent of $10 a, a month to about 5 million of the poorest people in Pakistan. These were people living on about $2 a day. And they had decided to issue bank cards so that those who lived within a bus ride from a city could go into the city and use their bank card in an ATM and every month get $10 and that would be a significant support for their life and their families. And what they discovered, unfortunately, after they had launched this program was what you're seeing on the screen which is the ATMs are saying, sorry, we cannot pay you the money. And again, the woman would type in her PIN code, and she would get the same response. And then she would do it a third time, and the machine would eat her card, and she wouldn't have access to that card for maybe a year. She'd have to go through the bureaucracy of trying to get her card back. So you can imagine the financial pain, and also the extraordinary inefficiency in that system. And so our job was to figure out, well, what was going wrong? So I spent a lot of time watching people at ATMs, and I very quickly actually figured out the problem. Unfortunately, it was one of many, many problems in the system. But since I've only got a few minutes to talk today, I'll just focus on one problem. And, and illustrate this with um, this little example. So <clears throat> here are three of the most important pieces of documentation in that woman's life. It's a Benazir Income Support Program card. It's the card with her PIN code on it, and it's a equivalent of a social security card. And this is what she would take with her to the ATM. And can you see the problem? You notice on her PIN code, that the person who gave it to her, the her pin card, has very thoughtfully written the numbers larger so that she can read them more easily. OK, that's helpful. The problem is that everybody in this chain that has designed and administered and managed the system is from the upper echelons in Pakistan and speaks English and knows how to write English. <laughs> but unfortunately, the people they're trying to serve, she doesn't speak English. She can't read or write English. She doesn't read or write Urdu either. But the one thing she does know about Urdu is that you write it 
from right to left. That's the one thing she knows. And so unfortunately, when she puts the pin into the ATM, she reads from right to left. And hundreds of thousands of people were doing that all over Pakistan. We went out into the field and tested this <laughs> with a cell phone and a piece of paper, and this is the result that we got. It's such a simple problem, but unfortunately, because there was nobody who had in the, in, the, in the design system who had that problem, who didn't understand, they couldn't design a system that would work for the people they were meant to be designing for. And they launched it without having tested it in the field. Millions of those cards were in circulation. That's what I mean by, it's very in order to see something clearly, you need to be able to not see something. And it's not just in emerging markets that we have this problem. This is a little video from, I'm not going to tell you the name of the car company, <laughs> um, but you'll... Akte Bluetooth Integrationsknopf, den man irgendwie drücken muss und dann gleichzeitig drücken und den Schlüssel drehen. was ich ziemlich und dann noch eine Nummer eingeben und das finde ich ziemlich spannend. Also den muss man drücken, drei Sekunden ja. halten, dann darf man den Schlüssel weiter drehen, dann muss man es nochmal drei Sekunden halten, dann muss man es losmachen und dann muss man eine Nummer eingeben. So apparently you need three hands <laughs> to get your Bluetooth to work. Now I, I'm sure that the engineer who designed it figured out a way that you didn't need three hands. The trouble is, he couldn't see that other people couldn't see it. And so as a result, most customers are incredibly frustrated with this particular model of car. And we had to explain why they were so frustrated. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about my journey. Um, and I spent the last 25 years learning to not understand things. And that's a strange thing to say. Um, I come from a, um, a highly academic background as a professor at MIT. I taught control theory, and I also taught design to the most brilliant students from anywhere in the world. And I, I, I love teaching them. I was in awe of my students. But what I noticed was that they were very, very good at solving the technical problem but they seemed to struggle with solving the human problem. They were not trained to ask questions and to understand the human point of view, to empathize with other people. And I became fascinated with that because it seemed like a new frontier for design. So I began consulting with local design firms and ended up working with um, uh, one of the, the design firms in the Boston area. And I engaged in an extraordinary num number of very interesting design programs, such as working with Pampers, where I uh, helped create, uh, reposition this product, um, create a design language for Pampers, so that the mother could recognize the brand of the diaper that she was using, and significantly increased their uh, business results. We actually ended up, I think we tripled the sales on this particular product. Um, so I'm, it's, it's with some strange satisfaction that I know that about half the babies in the Western world in the last 20 years or so have used a product that I've designed. Uh, <coughs> and then uh, a few years ago, I joined Frog, which is a, a larger, more digital design firm, and have really enjoyed the sort of very creative, um, innovative, engaging work that, that uh, we are asked to help our clients with, working in financial services. Um, right, <laughs> right now, if you're, if you're in San Francisco, we're working with the SF MoMA on the Magritte exhibit. Um, he talks about the, the, the treachery of, of art and the treachery of vision. And uh, so we brought some of his work to life and um, you can have a very interesting experience looking at his paintings now that we have digitized. And I think the Magritte would uh, appreciate what we have done for him. 
<clears throat> so why is design so important today? I think that <clears throat> design has always been important, but there have been th three fundamental technology changes that have completely transformed um, our business and probably your business. Starting with the launch of the public internet in 1993, for a smartphone in 1999, it looked a little bit different back then, and social networks in 2002. And of course that culminated in the iPhone and the other smartphones in 2007. And as a result, there's so much power in the hands of each individual consumer. They can search for a product, they can choose a product, they can buy a product from the comfort of their cell phone. And if they love the experience of using that product, they can tell all their friends. And if they're disappointed with the experience, they will tell 10 times as many friends. So as a result, a tweet can kill a brand or a politician. There's tremendous power now in that technology. And so firms have realized that they have to commit to improving the experience of their customers. And so they are embracing the power of design in order to do that. We can see that we've gone through this Cop Copernican transformation. We've gone from being enterprise-centric, in which the consumer rotated around the company, to now we are heliocentric or customer-centric, in which the enterprise rotates around the customer. And that's happening globally. Um, and I'm very honored to be part of Frog because Frog has, in to some extent, you know, benefited enormously from this customer-centric revolution, and we also helped to create it. Um, back in 1982, Frog was the company that partnered with Steve Jobs and Apple, and we helped design the first Apple computers and designed, created their design language, some elements of which continue to this day. And <clears throat> Apple, as much as any company, has helped to put that power in the hands of the individual consumer and also generated enormous wealth in the process. More recently, we can see that companies like um, Disney have embraced bringing technology into their experience. And I, I, I love this picture because what you're looking at here is a business model. Okay, let me explain. This little this little girl is having the best day of her life because she is meeting somebody who she thinks is a princess. And this princess knows her name. That's just blowing her mind. And her parents are looking on with such joy because their daughter is having such a great day. And how is this possible? Look closely at her right hand. There's an armband on it, which is a very clever armband, which has have an RFID and near-field device chip in it. That means that Disney knows, in Disney World, where everybody is. And this is, by the way, about the size of Manhattan. They know where everybody is. They know who they are. They know when they joined when they entered the park, they know who they're with, and as a result, this princess knows her name, and her parents paid extra for this meeting. <laughs> and her parents are totally delighted with this experience, and are gonna tell all their friends, and are gonna start saving up to bring their daughter back next year. And in 20 years' time, they'll do the same for their daughter's children, for their grandchildren. And that little device there probably adds about a billion dollars a year to Disney's revenue from that park. So what we're looking at here is a very sophisticated business model, which is brought to life through the combination of technology and the design of an experience. Now at a more prosaic level, <coughs> we can see this notion of experience design is pervading every single business in the Western world, and most of the, the rest of the world, too. It's around net promoter score, customer satisfaction, minimizing churn. Customer experience design is the best way to impact those scores, and that 
drives revenue. It's a very simple equation. Design is good for business. Good design improves customer experience, shapes customer behavior, and grows businesses. That's how it works. <laughs> and I'm in the business of providing good design that grows our customers' business, which means that they pay us. It's a wonderful, virtuous cycle. Um, <clears throat> let me step back for a couple of minutes and talk a little bit about the language of design. What is design? So here's an important name to, to know, Charles Eames. Charles and Ray Eames, husband and wife team, um, based in Venice, California. That's where their studio was towards the end of their time. Um, created extraordinary influential design. Um, if you are interested in furniture, you probably know the Eames chair. At an exhibit in Paris in 1969, Charles Eames was asked, well, what is design? And I love this definition. Design is a plan for arranging elements in such a way as best to accomplish a particular purpose. It's a plan. It's an idea for the future. It's around arranging things, organizing things, for a purpose. Okay? And if we're clear about that, then it gives us, as designers, license to do almost anything, which I love. There's a spectrum of design. At one end, at one end is the more ta tactical design, that is just addressing the look and feel of a product. And at the other end is the more strategic advice end. And designers operate along that spectrum. And it's helpful as you work with designers to understand where they are. Different types of designers are attracted towards different ends of that spectrum. Frog works more towards the strategic end, um, and the <coughs> we are less executional. But design, all designers are driven by passion. That's what gets us up in the morning. We want to get things done. So if you're interested in working with designers, remember Yes, yes, we like to get paid, but what really motivates us is the idea that we're going to have an impact in the world. That ignites our passion, and that, in that way we deliver our best work. Designers also think differently. And this can be good, that's why you hire us, but it can also be a challenge. Uh, we're very, very human-centered, so the most important thing in our world is the consumer, the customer, the citizen that we're designing for. And when we look at constraints, when our clients try to put us in a box and tell us about constraints, then we tend to think, well, how can I break that constraint? And that's good, right? That's what you're asking us to do, how to break that constraint. But sometimes it can be frustrating because sometimes you just need us to stay in the box and we don't sit there comfortably. Also, Designers sometimes have different priorities, your cost versus the customer's experience. <laughs> and in most companies, cost versus customer experience, cost is maybe more important, whereas for designers, customer experience is definitely more important. So there's an interesting dialogue that can take place between a designer and a company. And we hope that at the end of that dialogue, we end up at the, <laughs> at the right compromise. Uh, if you think about the companies that have had the biggest impact, it's where they've basically broken the rules. If you look at the largest companies in the United States right now, and go back and look at the popular press around Apple and the launch, launch of the um, iPod, or Google when it was deciding to go public, or Facebook, and what you will notice is that people dismissed them because they were breaking these rules. They were just human-centered. They were violating constraints. They, they didn't even make money. How could they possibly go, go public where they don't have any revenue? But they broke the rules, and that's why they're the largest companies in the world. So don't not design. <clears throat> design reinvents products. Um, a couple of designers in our studio in New York decided that they could reinvent the dishwasher so it could live on a, on a countertop, it doesn't have to be under the counter. It's a wonderful idea, and it's been picked up by press all over the world, 
And now we're confronting engineers with, how the heck do we make that possible? <laughs> um, but we will. We'll, we'll find a way to make that happen. And design can also transform the experience, even of financial services. And part of the reason I'm here is because we used to work with Laura way back in the day, um, helping to transform the experience at BNY Mellon Bank. Design helps to move targets. Um, you may set the target for design, but because designers are totally focused on the customer, we may end up moving that target. And that's what you pay us to do. So beware. In closing, let me just talk a little bit about the new dimensions of design, where design is going, and then comment about some of the power and the risks that I think we're going to confront in this new world of design. Today, design exists mostly in either the three-dimensional object or the space or the two-dimensional interaction. But over the last couple of years, and the pace of this is accelerating, is we're adding a new dimension to design, which is you. Um, and we now reach the point where on a digital experience, we can customize that experience for every individual. And on the one hand, this is wonderful, because we can now simplify very complex services with personalized conversations that relate just to you as an individual, and we can communicate with you both graphically and also through voice in a way that seems completely natural as if you're talking to your most trusted friend. And so using these tools and these tricks, we can make you very, very comfortable with the service, and we can totally simplify that experience. However, with great power comes great responsibility. And I think this applies to design and to everybody in the audience here. We have to watch out for that balance between the simplicity that good design can bring to an experience versus seduction and we're about to unleash in financial services the same equi the equivalent to what we have done in the uh, food industry. And we have seen the um, <coughs> impact of um, carefully manufactured food on the obesity crisis in the United States. Simplicity versus seduction. Um, adaptation to the individual versus duplicity. Customization versus manipulation. I look forward to discussing with you and learning from you over the next couple of days how we bring the power of design to improve the experiences of everybody here and the rest of the world and how we bring to bear some of the incredible AI tools that are emerging and we avoid falling in, into any of the traps or taking advantage unfairly of those tools. Thank you very much.